up on Dialogue Weekend. China proposes a global data security initiative. How will it work? The U.S. revokes visas of more than 1,000 Chinese students and researchers. Why are they being targeted? And this week's newsmaker. Now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qinzhu. Thanks to the digital revolution in our work and life, data security has gained increasing importance not only to our daily lives but also national security. Adding to that, global geopolitical rivalry has also contributed to the prominence of the issue. China, as one of the most advanced countries in digital technologies and big data, has proposed a global initiative on data security to respond to the new issues and new challenges emerging in the field. To learn more about the initiative and its potential impact, we have Professor Chen Hong from East China Normal University, Andy Mock, Senior Research Fellow from the Center for China and Globalization, and Rick Dunham. Former White House correspondent for Business Week. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. So uh, let me try to get some of the uh, the real ideas, the essence of the initiative uh, made by the Chinese government. Uh, Andy, I want to start with you. You know, what are some of the highlights of the initiative from China? Well, I think at a high level, Tsingdua, there's a couple things going on here. So there's a lot of attention in the media uh, about the U.S.-China rivalry with tech at the center of it, and certainly this is a factor. But I think we also need to be careful not to make the mistake of thinking that the tail is wagging the dog, meaning that everything China does is in response to a U.S. provocation. But I think the most important driver here is, as we all know, uh, the digital economy or digital uh, advances really are becoming central to every sphere of life. And security has tended to lag behind. So I think one of the most important things going on here is China taking a leadership role. As President Xi has uh, emphasized over a number of years, uh, this question of cyber sovereignty uh, is very, very important. So I think this is one important element of that. But that being said, uh, of course, uh, China uh, lives in a global community, and it's not just the United States, but other countries in Europe, uh, other parts of the world also face this challenge. And I think China is looking to address particular challenges with the U.S., but also uh, to assume a greater leadership role globally as well. Mm -hmm. Well, Rick, uh, if you take a look at uh, some of the points in the initiative, for example, it calls for countries to stand against activities that impair or steal important data of other states' critical infrastructure. So it addresses or tries to address the concern about uh, you know, the uh, uh, safety of security of infrastructure, national infrastructure. Uh, isn't it uh, really uh, I mean, a good point uh, if every country can agree upon that? Well, for the Chinese government, I think this is both a defensive and an offensive document. A lot of the things sound very good. A lot of the things there's universal agreement on, like just what you mentioned. Um, but it also includes some things that the Chinese government favors that are controversial around the world. Uh, the whole issue of, of, of cyber sovereignty is, is, is one of those because it means that countries can have whatever restrictions they want, that, that, that tech companies would have to follow the local uh, laws even if that meant turning over the data, uh, although you had the promise of this, this free internet. Uh, I, and I also think it's an issue of the Chinese government uh, looking or trying to look as, it's the, as if it's the multilateral leader while Donald Trump is a unilateral dictator. And so that's, I, I think that that ideologically is what is out there. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, the entire uh, issue of following the laws of local countries uh, w it, it is a poison pill for a lot of the world because if they want to conduct business in China or if, it, if there are other authoritarian countries, uh, they would have to turn over data at the request of local law enforcement. And that's something that, uh, that, that, that is a problem for a lot of Europe and, and, and a lot of the other countries in Asia as well. Uh, but Chen Hong, you know, like if you uh, do investment or 
you know, conduct whatever business in a particular country. I mean, rather than obeying the local law and the rules and the practice, what else can you do? I mean, uh, it's not, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, the law itself is not uh, reasonable, uh, but that's the general practice, right? Yes, I think actually locally, of course, I think in some particular, you know, uh, 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 you know, legal scenarios, the local law overrides, you know, any particular, uh, you know, interest that can be asserted upon, upon uh, those businesses. I think actually in the initiative, there's a, you know, quite clear expressed, you know, indication that actually China opposes their own lawful transfer of data from one country to another and actually the local laws and also legal system need to be respected. That is very important as the previous commentator was mentioning about the uh, cyber sovereignty. Cyber sovereignty is actually quite tantamount to actually the uh, uh, political and also territorial uh, sovereignty. So I think actually, th yes indeed, this is both defensive and offensive because actually it refu refutes, you know, repudiates any you know, accusations about you know, the uh, businesses, the Chinese businesses, you know, transferring you know, the uh, overseas generated data from uh, the uh, respective countries to back to China. That actually has never happened and China will never do such a kind of you know, things to defy the local laws. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the initiative also said that it encourages and respects companies' independent decisions to choose data storage locations, mm -hmm. which is important, uh, part of the controversial uh, you know, discussions uh, around the world. And also, uh, it encourages countries to refrain mm -hmm. from forcing domestic companies to store data from overseas in their own territory. Uh, Andy, I think that's a reasonable, reasonable point you know, for any country, uh, you know, even if it's your own company, you don't force your company, say, to somehow share the data with you, the data from overseas, from other countries, or without permission at least. Mm -hmm. No, in indeed, Tsingduo. Uh, but I think Rick makes a very good point here in that I think at the level of principles, there is broad agreement, but that being said, we are also seeing a clash of values here as well, and I think this will be very hard uh, to resolve in a universal way. But where it gets really tricky is as we descend into greater, greater levels of detail, and as they say, the devil is in the details, so that there are both trade-offs, there, there are important trade-offs for these uh, types of policy objectives or stances. So, of course, companies will say this imposes uh, additional, uh, perhaps uh, unbearable costs uh, on them. And, you know, they're looking for greater standardization, uh, economies of scale, uh, all of these things that can drive a greater profitability and more streamlined operations. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, there are good reasons for this as well from a policy perspective and from a business perspective. So I think, again, uh, we really have to see this is, uh, I think, not only uh, an important development from China's domestic development, but it's also an olive branch uh, that is being held out to say, look, we're willing to work with every country and in particular the U.S. to reach an agreement on this and let's see if we can work out the details. Mm -hmm. Well, initiative uh, uh, ask countries to refrain from uh, obtaining you know, data located in other states through companies or individuals without other states' uh, permission. Uh, this is again about the transfer of data across national borders. In a way, either it is cooperative mm -hmm. or the wrong way, it is a secret or it is illegal. Uh, Rick, what's, what's your understanding of that? Uh, well, I, th I think that uh, overall cybersecurity lags behind uh, other kinds of business in terms of global regulation and global rules. Trade has rules, the World Trade Organization, and you know, there's, a, there, there's a lot of dispute and there's, there, and, and there's a body to deal with it. I think that cybersecurity needs to enter the 21st century and we need to get some sort of overall ground rules that uh, people respect globally, but there are going to be continuing disagreements. And I think one of the things that uh, the Chinese government wants to point out here is uh, United States uh, in particular, but also uh, Russia, 
uh, does a lot of uh, cyber spying uh, in other countries. Uh, just look at the Snowden uh, leaks. And, to, and they, want, they want in the rules to say that that is improper, that that is illegal. So I think it's, it's very interesting. You have to have rules of the game of what everybody should follow. And I think if, if, you, if you look at the points that were made here, they're all logical. But as we've all been saying, the devil is in the details, and there are going to be conflicts. You're, gonna, you're going to say that you should uh, only, uh, only store your data locally, and it shouldn't be available to other governments. But you're also saying that law enforcement in each country, because of cyber sovereignty, uh, can demand data as a condition of you uh, having your business in their country operating in their country. So I think that there are going to be conflicts, but the idea of having rules is a good one. And, and unilateralism is bad. You do need to figure out multilateralism. Maybe the U.S. will have a new administration next year and go to the table and, and have good in faith, I, uh, good faith bargaining on this. I mean, I think this is the future, and I think this is sort of a, a first draft of what we're going to be seeing in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, another interesting point in the initiative uh, is that you know, information and communication technology products and services, uh, the providers of uh, the products and services uh, should not install back doors in their products and their services. I think at least this is good news if it becomes true uh, for private users like you and me, right? And of course, uh, uh, it, yes. is, um, uh, it, it also addresses the concern of the, uh, you know, whether there is a leakage of data or the leak of uh, the personal information, Andy. No, absolutely. And you know, the, there is a certain uh, irony here that uh, you know, the U.S. is most well known for both the scale and the scope and perhaps even we could say the audacity of its uh, cyber surveillance. So everything uh, that the NSA does originally from capturing radio signals to, as we saw with a lot of the Snowden uh, revelations, um, that this is uh, indeed, I think, a good thing. And where we are is ideally uh, there can be a set of rules that are largely agreed upon. And I think this is what's lacking here. Um, but I, I think it's also important to point out that companies can agree to not install back doors, and that certainly is a good thing. But how sometimes these back doors or these, uh, uh, how surveillance is carried out is let's say you have a server, and of course this was back in the day when there were physical servers and maybe in a cloud world this won't happen. Um, but these uh, pieces of equipment are intercepted, leaving the factory, and then you know these back doors are put in without the knowledge of the manufacturer. So I think that it's an important step, uh, but it's not a panacea. It's not a silver bullet that will guarantee, uh, even on paper, 100% uh, security. Mm -hmm. Well, Chen Hong, at least here, as uh, pointed out by Ken Andy, that you know we do need a set of rules, international rules, so every country, in particular the big countries like uh, United States, China, Russia, so they can follow the rules. At least uh, they can make sure like uh, they are not spying each other, and then the rest of the world will feel safe too. Yes, yes, definitely agree. I think actually the uh, cyberspace is a new thing. So that actually a lot of things actually are still remaining as a vacuum, in particular as to rules and laws uh, to regulate. We talk about digital governance, which actually will be regulating behaviors and conducts, you know, carried out by companies and also individuals and also states. So in this regard, actually, I think this initiative is particularly timely in that actually it attempts to, you know, you know, you know promote and also to, uh, uh, you know, Propose a set of you know altogether eight points you know which will actually really be you know uh, 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 regulating you know the uh, activities that can be carried out by those uh, stakeholders. That is very very important. As for the uh, uh, you know, I was also thinking about you know, Snowden and also some other cases in that actually we see some state actors have been you know doing rather you know malicious acts using taking advantage of their you know technological edge you know, to, uh, uh, you know, stoop, you know, over, you know, other 
states and also individuals, you know, uh, uh, secrets, and that is definitely, you know, to be deterred if actually a multilateral platform can be, you know, installed. This is a multilateral platform, not a bilateral one. So that actually, it's almost like, you know, well, yeah, for example, like we have got International Sea Convention. So this is also like actually a kind of initiative w that will serve as a platform to regulate behaviors on a multilateral, you know, uh, pattern, and that can be really, you know, be quite quite an important initiative. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's uh, move on from this uh, uh, data security to the bilateral relationship or one area of the relationship between China and the U.S. Following a series of actions against China, the Trump administration has revoked the visas of more than 1,000 Chinese students. Well, this latest move is not completely unexpected still. It sends shock waves throughout Chinese society. The U.S. has uh, cited uh, security risk as the reason to justify their singling out of the Chinese students. But the ban seems to go beyond graduate students in advanced scientific fields, also targeting undergraduate students and uh, those studying uh, economics and finance. So to gain a better understanding of the policy from Washington on Chinese students, we again have uh, Rick, Andy, and Professor Chen Hong. Uh, so Rick, What's the explanation or what uh, kind of evidence uh, has the Department, uh, State Department of the U.S. You know, given in revoking the visas of uh, more than 1,000 Chinese students? Well, I would argue that the evidence is spotty. There's anecdotal evidence uh, that has been released of specific uh, spying issues, and there's a cat and mouse game uh, with some uh, Chinese researchers in the, uh, in the U.S. So, Obviously, there is some some uh, technology transfer, but this but but this goes way beyond the specific cases that we know about. Uh, and I, I do have concerns as somebody who uh, teaches in China, uh, an, inter, an inter international scholar, and works with international students, if, to start making students uh, pawns in geopolitics. Uh, especially, you know, I I have a lot of my former students from Tsinghua University who are studying for PhDs in the United States. And they're not government spies. So they're, they're studying communication. Uh, they're studying economics. Uh, their parents are paying. The government has nothing to do with it. And that's what I, I worry about, uh, people getting caught up and being afraid to study. I mean, I would think that the United States would want Chinese students to study economics or finance in the U.S. because uh, they're so proud of the American uh, economic system. Uh, so to me, it just doesn't make sense to go beyond uh, the specific areas where there are legitimate concerns about technology transfer or research being stolen. Mm -hmm. Well, Andy, are you similarly concerned about the action by the U.S. government? And of course, if you look at the uh, higher education institutions, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the Chinese students you know, make up the largest body of foreign students uh, at these uh, uh, institutions. Uh, about 370,000 uh, of Chinese students enrolled. So how will that impact uh, on the overall situation in the higher education area? No, Qingdu, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, this is a very uh, concerning situation uh, for, for everyone involved. So clearly, uh, this is not good for the Chinese students. But I think, let me talk a little bit about why this is actually so bad for the U.S. And I think uh, the negative effects really fall into two areas. So one is practical, and then the second is ideological. So from a practical perspective, as you mentioned, 370,000 uh, Chinese foreign students in the United States. So while it's only 1,000 so far, that have had their visas revoked. I think this will have a chilling effect, and this might not, and this might only be the beginning. So not only uh, do many college towns, many universities, local economies uh, depend on these foreign students, but the backbone of the U.S.'s uh, scientific R&D apparatus uh, really are foreign students and Chinese. Uh, graduate students, uh, postdocs, uh, et cetera. So without this very, very uh, crucial workforce, I think the U.S. Uh, ability to conduct cutting-edge R&D 
will be affected. So I think this is, uh, you know, one very negative practical impact beyond the economic impact. Then from an ideological perspective, and this is more subtle, but one of the challenges the U.S. has always faced is that it is a state but not a nation. So the U.S. talks about it's exceptional because anyone can become an American as long as one subscribes to these American ideals of democracy, free markets, uh, treating people fairly, due process, these things. And now these students, it seems, uh, are being targeted for who they are. And where do you stop? Because if we say, look at an MIT, look at a Stanford, do they do any work that supports the U.S. military? And in a world where these technologies like AI, robotics, uh, 5G, et cetera, quantum, uh, almost any technology that we can talk about really is dual use. So how do you draw that line? So I think what's happening here at an ideologi from an ideological perspective is this is undermining the very notion of how the U.S. defines itself. So I think all in all, this is really uh, a terrible thing for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. Well, in addition to, of course, the visa revocation, uh, you know, if you look at the international media reports, some of the Chinese students were basically, you know, uh, experiencing tightened screening at the border uh, uh, inspection. Uh, some call it like, um, uh, you know, uh, basically a harassment by the border agents simply because they are Chinese students. Uh, so, you know, some of them are saying that I will never come back to this country. And already a spokesman from the Chinese foreign ministry says, you know, the U.S. move amounts to outright political persecution and racial discrimination. But the Professor Chen Hong, you know, I want to ask you about this long-term impact psychologically and in terms of the Chinese impression of the U.S. or whether they will send their kids or themselves go to the U.S. for further studies. How is that impact? Yes, I think actually the uh, uh, education experience in the United States or in any other country is actually immersive experience in which one actually will be experiencing the uh, exposure you know, in the society, the culture, and also the uh, interactions with the local community and society and culture. Those are very important to shape and reshape one's impression of the country and also, you know, especially after the uh, educational experiences, those students, after they return to China, they establish, you know, as a kind of very positive understanding and impression of their country. That is actually an important asset. I always, you know, want to, uh, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, make this point to be understood by Western countries that those students, they are actually really, you know, the assets for both countries, you know, not only for China, but also for the United States, for Australia, for Canada, a number of, you know, Western countries. They carry a positive message about uh, uh, those countries, but since such a kind of very, you know, excruciating, you know, harassment, harassing, you know, experiences they encountered, uh, either at, at the border, at the customs, or you, even, you know, in, you know, in the, uh, uh, in, the uh, in, in the respective, com uh, you know, universities, such experiences really will be, you know, establishing a very negative, you know, understanding, and they carry the negative message back to China, you know, to their fellow students and also their fellow, you know, members of that generation. So that is actually in the long term very negative and damaging to a long term positive understanding and uh, yeah, uh, confidence in America as, uh, you know, as the previous, you know, uh, 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 commentator was actually talking about uh, positive, uh, kind of open, democratic, you know, such a kind of, you know, uh, institutional, you know, uh, uh, society. That is actually quite damaging, I think, actually, for the uh, uh, you know, uh, law enforcement officers and also decision makers and policy makers in the United States. They should also take this into consideration. You know, the uh, education is an exchange experience, not just one-sided, and we should really remember that point very very deeply. Well, it's a two-way experience, uh, uh, absolutely. Well, let's leave it there for now and yes. take a look at uh, this week's uh, Newsmaker.
welcome back. Uh, I guess you know, all of our guests, including me, myself, we had the experience, you know, or have the experience of uh, ordering food and have our food delivered at our door. So uh, I would start with Andy. You know, what is it like to be a food delivery driver in China? You know, for the international audience. Well, that's a great question, Xingdo. So. Um, you know, I know that there's been some uh, media coverage in China that also has uh, gotten some international uh, coverage as well. That it's a very difficult life. Uh, you know, your the algorithm is your master, and that it's dangerous, uh, it's stressful, and I think to a degree that is true. But I would also maybe strike a positive note here too, in that. For many of these drivers, they come, especially from a city like Beijing or Shanghai, there are these uh, uh, you know, so-called Beikiao or Waidira, meaning that these are uh, people from the hinterlands that may not have the best education, uh, that may not have a lot of social capital in Beijing. And these jobs are entry-level jobs that let them make uh, quite a comfortable living, uh, even by Beijing standards. Of course, they are working very hard. It is stressful. Uh, but it also is the first rung on the ladder of success as well. Uh, but that being said, that doesn't mean that uh, conditions can't be improved, as, as we've seen from some of these stories, uh, where I think companies uh, are making efforts to make lives better. Mm -hmm. While also uh, maintaining good customer service. Right. Well, Rick, you know who should be held accountable, or responsible here for the hazardous work conditions uh, of the food delivery drivers. You know, for the customers like you and me, probably you know to wait for extra two minutes or three minutes, it's not a big deal, right? Right. Exactly. I, I think there, you have to answer that on two levels. One is that the immediate uh, people responsible are the companies, the companies that hire them to send them out, the restaurants that want, want the uh, food delivered right away. But broadly, it's us, the customers. I mean, I, 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 I want it right away, but I want their lives to be uh, less stressful. I want mm -hmm. them to be, have safer conditions. I would be willing to pay a few more RMB uh, for that. I, I'd be willing to wait five more minutes. Uh, I mean, people want what they want now. They want it for as little money as possible. Uh, but I think that uh, I, I think that that's a compromise that would be good for everyone. Uh, I mean, these workers work really hard. Uh, some of my multimedia students at Tsinghua have done stories on uh, on this projects on uh, on on the drivers from the hinterlands who come to make a new life uh, in Beijing, and uh, and you want. To, to give them a decent life. Uh, and so I, th I think we as customers are the ones ultimately responsible. And we have to be willing to wait five more minutes. We have to be willing to pay just a little more money so that there's not as much stress and there's not, not as much uh, trouble with the drivers with safe, safety of them running over uh, pedestrians or bikers on the, on the streets of Beijing or Shanghai. Well, the good news is like, uh, you know, uh, the two largest platforms have basically installed a new button uh, for the customers uh, to basically give the uh, delivery person, you know, extra two or five or ten minutes. Uh, so hopefully their life will be less, uh, you know, uh, less pressure, uh, easier for them to continue with their work. Well, with that, we are coming to the end of today's show. Uh, many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Jinduo. You can find me on Twitter, Xu Jinduo. Thank you for watching. See you next time.